I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so first, to give you an overview of my talk, um, I'm going to sort of review some of the basic principles of transplant infectious diseases. Um, and then we'll move on and we'll talk about some of the most important pathogens and their treatment. Um, and obviously, I'm sort of focusing on the renal transplant patient in this talk. Um, I can talk about other kinds of transplants, but I have a feeling you're not interested. Um, so we'll focus on CMV, BK virus, and fungi. And then if we have time, I have um, one extra question uh, uh, on on a topic that's fairly relevant for kidney transplant patients. So first, basic principles. Um, infection in transplant recipients, um, you have to remember they're vulnerable to both opportunistic infections and also community-acquired infections. So you have to sort of think in, in two arms when you think about what potential pathogens they could have. The other thing to remember is that infection can result from exposure to a relatively no, low number of organisms. So the renal transplant patient who goes out to dinner with family and eats at a restaurant where there's like salmonella contamination of the food they don't have to eat very much to get sick. Um, and sometimes those patients are the first ones to show up at the doctor's office with the symptoms of something that's actually breaking out in the community. Um, and so sometimes, in this sense, they can be sort of the canary in a coal mine. They're going to be the first person who shows up with influenza when it's influenza season and this sort of thing. So the inflammatory response to infection is suppressed in transplant patients. This is really important to remember. They, ha they have very attenuated signs and symptoms of infection. So um, it, it means that the renal transplant patient with pneumonia might show up in your office with a bit of a cough and a temperature to 100.2, um, and they feel a little under the weather. But if you do a chest x-ray, they have a really socked in pneumonia. So you know, in my line of work, we, we sort of think about transplant patients as, you know, when they have an infection, they sort of skate along this line where they look OK, they look OK, they look OK, and then they fall off the cliff, and they get really, really sick. So your, your job is to sort of remember that they don't show you that they're sick for quite some time until they're really, really quite infected. So you have to pick things up earlier. And then lastly, the transplant recipient with an infection has a higher burden of organisms once infection is established. So although it doesn't take much of an exposure for them to get you know, salmonella or influenza, once they have it, they don't have normal host defenses. And so this means that they can sort of be teeming with organisms. So this really has infection control uh, implications for transmissible infections. You have to make sure you get the precautions right. And for example, at my institution, if you have dermatomal zoster and you're an immunocompromised patient, including anyone who has a solid organ transplant, then you are actually put on the precautions that are considered appropriate for a normal host with disseminated zoster. So that means gowns, negative pressure room, um, because they are more transmissible than your regular host. So um, in 1998, Jay Fishman and Bob Rubin wrote this awesome review article for the New England Journal. Um, they were practicing at MGH at the time. The, the article really lays out the basic principles of transplant infectious diseases. I think it's worth reviewing a couple of their main um, points. So the first point is you have to understand the net state of immunosuppression of the patient when, when you think they have an infection. So the obvious thing that you sort of everybody thinks about is the dose and duration of immunosuppressive medications. You can't, um, you have to remember it's not just about what they have gotten in the last, you know, week or, or sort of their maintenance immunosuppression. You have to think, well, okay, this person got rituximab three months ago or, you know, they got CAMPATH when they, they had induction and so they're going to be at higher risk. So there's that part. Then you have to think about whether there are mechanical factors that are contributing to their immunocompromise. So I think in the renal transplant patient, you know, what, what you might end up thinking about is like an indwelling venous catheter, particularly and somebody who just went to transplant and then needs some dialysis and doesn't have a fistula right after transplant, they're going to have that line, and that line might predispose them to infection. Another example um, that I see in, in my work sort of with um, the cancer center where I am is that sometimes people have lymphedema from malignancies, or I, I have seen it from disruption of pelvic lymph nodes from a kidney transplant, and so they get lymphedema in that leg, and um, when you have lymphedema, you're very predisposed to getting streptococcal cellulitis in that extremity, so um, mechanical things that predispose you to infection. Then the last thing you have to think about with these patients is, do they have some other infection that has made them immunocompromised? So the classic example of an infection that makes you immunocompromised is obviously HIV. Um, but in transplant patients, CMV actually can make patients more vulnerable to other infections. Um, so once they have an active CMV viremia, you have to remember that they're going to be more vulnerable to other things.
So the other sort of important point they make in this review article is that you have to understand epidemiologic exposures. So again, it's, it's sort of obvious with all patients that we're thinking about new exposures or recent exposures. So the restaurant where there was a salmonella outbreak or you know, be, having a family member with influenza, these are all sort of the obvious things we usually think about. But in these patients, you need to think about remote exposures that can reactivate. So the classic example of that is tuberculosis. Latent tuberculosis can reactivate, of course. But in, you know, in this day and age, transplant patients move around a lot. Um, you have to think about whether somebody grew up in, in sort of Arizona, for example. They might have been exposed to coccidioides, and that could reactivate after transplant. Histoplasmosis is another one that could reactivate. The other thing that we have an increasing appreciation for is um, DNA viruses. You know, we think about CMV and VZV a lot in these patients. Um, so ha having had those previously can set you up to get it again. There are other DNA viruses where we're, we're sort of, again, having evol an evolving understanding. So hepatitis B in particular, if somebody had hepatitis B in the past, they can reactivate it. Even if they sort of cleared the virus before transplant, it can still come back depending upon the uh, line of immunosuppressive therapy. Okay, so moving on, let's do my first case. This is a 35-year-old woman. Um, who is CMV negative with a history of lupus nephritis, and she has a renal transplant from a CMV positive donor. And um, the prophylaxis she gets is with valgenciclovir and trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole right after transplant. She has an uncomplicated course, and she goes home. Unfortunately, two weeks post-transplant, she prevent, presents with a fever to 102 without any localizing symptoms. So. Which uh, is the least likely source of her fever? And I'm, we're going to do audience response here. Um, so A, PCP pneumonia. B, wound infection due to staph aureus. C, urinary tract infection due to Klebsiella pneumoniae. Or D, nosocomial pneumonia. So you can go ahead and ring in. Okay, give you a little bit longer, and then I'm going to cut you off. Okay, <laughs> sorry. I, next time I'll give you more warning. Uh, so this is what people thought. So most people thought PCP pneumonia, and I agree with that assessment. So, um, and this sort of gets into the next slide I'm about to show you. Whoops, let me. Um, but. Um, She's on PCP prophylaxis, so obviously that should prevent it. But, but even if she weren't, it turns out PCP reactivation is not typically in the first month after transplant, whereas all these nosocomial and or um, procedure-related infections I've listed here are things that come up um, during the first month after transplant. So any of them are possible. So th this slide is sort of uh, the, the guidance that I, I give to all transplant ID fellows when they start. You know, when we, ha when we think about the HIV patient, we think about their CD4 count to guide us into thinking about like what kinds of infections they're gonna have. And with the transplant recipient, there's really two things that you use sort of together as a combined tool to help you think through what infections they'll have. The first is when was the transplant? How long ago? And the second is have they been treated for rejection recently? So if the transplant was in the last month, typically what they show up with are nosocomial things, things they were exposed to in their hospital stay. So typically those tend to be bacterial or potentially candida related. So UTIs, line infection, pneumonia. Sometimes it's procedure related, so it's a wound infection or like a urine leak, um, an infected seroma. We see these things you know, oftentimes in the first month after transplant. Occasionally in this period, we'll see a donor-derived infection. Um, and, and those are, they present weirdly, typically. I mean, it, it really depends on what the person got from the donor. But these days, it's really strange things that, that pop up that are unanticipated, things like microsporidium, for example, we had at my institution. Um, so then once you're one to six months out from transplant, that's really when your immunosuppression has sort of set in, the induction set in, and that's when you see the opportunistic infections. So this is when you see, in the absence of prophylaxis, CMV reactivation, BK starts showing up, VZV if you're not on prophylaxis, nocardia or listeria can show up, 
PCP if you're not on prophylaxis, um, et cetera. And then if you've, you're more than six months out from transplant, but you were just you know, given three days of pulse dose steroids, or you were given you know, rituximab plus phoresis plus IVIG for antibody-mediated rejection, but you're eight months out, you would still sort of pop back into this middle box where you've got to think about your opportunists. Um, if you've had no rejection and you're more than six months out, that's when you think about community-acquired pathogens. So this is when the patients show up with influenza, norovirus, um, strep pneumo. Now, it doesn't mean that the manifestation of those illnesses is, is normal. Turns out transplant patients have a really hard time dealing with norovirus, so they might show up to your office with like eight days of profuse diarrhea that's causing dehydration, and it takes them two weeks to get over norovirus, but nonetheless, norovirus is just a regular community-acquired infection, right? They picked it up from someone out in the community, and they just don't have normal host defenses, so it's sort of a slightly longer illness. Um, and sometimes they pick up things that are out sort of in the community like cryptococcus or endemic fungi. If they have a new exposure to those, they can show up with that, you know, a long time after transplant. So I, I don't think of it as an opportunist in the sense that it's, um, it's something they ran out, they ran into out in the community. It's not hospital related and it's not a reactivation process. Okay. So moving on, the last sort of bit of background, um, it's really important in this day and age to really understand immunosuppressants in these patients. And I know that you need to know this when you're thinking about how to deal with rejection and this sort of thing. And so you know it from that side. But when somebody shows up with an infection, you have to like sort of recontextualize how you think about their immunosuppressants. So biological agents and targeted therapies like bortezomib, you really have to think about the mechanism and what that's going to do to the person's immunity to understand what they might have. So the mechanism is really going to be the key to predicting host susceptibility. So just a couple of examples. Rituximab, it's a very widely used drug for lots of things, including humoral rejection. It's an anti-CD20 antibody. So what it's going to do is it's going to take out your CD20 positive B cells, right? So when you do that, you actually make it so that the person can't really respond to vaccines. And that effect lasts for 6 to 12 months after you give the rituximab. So if you are treating somebody for rejection, you have to remember that because, you know, if you give them the flu vaccine two months later, it might not really be that protective. And you need to warn the patient about this. You need to sort of make sure you keep an eye on them. Um, it can also, you know, if, if people get rituximab repeatedly over time, so somebody's really struggling with rejection or, you know, they have underlying lupus, let's say, and they have a flare unrelated to their transplant and they're getting it intermittently, those patients can actually get hypogammaglobulinemic and that can set them up to re for recurrent respiratory tract infections, recurrent pneumonias and this sort of thing. Um, and that's all sort of, again, related to the mechanism of rituximab. The other example is, is a little more elegant. So eculizumab, as you all know, is a C5 complement inhibitor approved for the treatment of atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome and paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. So that one basically creates a situation where y you behave as if you have a congenital terminal complement deficiency. And you may remember from medical school, people with con congenital terminal complement deficiency are particularly vulnerable to meningococcus. So when people are getting eculizumab, um, you have to vaccinate them before they get the eculizumab for meningococcus. There's two different meningococcal vaccines now, one for ACWNY and the other one for, for B, type B meningococcus. And you have to remember in, in somebody not necessarily a renal transplant patient, but somebody with atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome who's getting dosed, you know, every few weeks with eculizumab over many, many months, um, the vaccines are not exclusively protective. So those patients can still get meningococcus, and there are definitely reports out there of people getting meningococcus despite being vaccinated. So you need to sort of stick that in your head and remember, again, with this type of immunosuppression. The other thing is, if somebody's been treated with rituximab and they're not doing well and then they get eculizumab, look out. You've got to think about what you're going to do, right? Because the vaccine's not going to protect them at all if you give it to them after they've gotten rituximab. So you sort of have to have your thinking cap on. The other sort of side note I'll make about immunosuppressants, which is a positive note, is that um, mammalian, mammalian target of rapamycin or mTOR inhibitors like um, sirolimus or everolimus really have some interesting antiviral properties. And it, it turns out patients on these drugs do have less CMV reactivation. 
um, than people on alternative regimens. Um, and so we, we try and harness this sometimes in, at my institution, sirolimus is used for stem cell transplant patients and it does have a measurable impact. Um, the other thing which I, I'm sure you all have probably heard is that um, the mTOR inhibitors can also help with people who develop a Kaposi sarcoma. When you switch them to that, you can see regression of, of the Kaposi sarcoma. Okay, so let's move on and talk about pathogens. So we'll do another case. This is a 57-year-old man who presents with 10 days of abdominal pain, nausea, and anorexia. He also has low-grade fevers. He has no other symptoms. Um, he has end-stage renal disease from hypertension. He had a deceased donor renal transplant eight months ago and got ATG induction. Um, he's CMV donor-positive, recipient negative, and he got six months of um, valgenciclovir prophylaxis. His current meds include mycophenolate, tacrolimus, prednisone, uh, Bactrim, and metoprolol. On exam, uh, his temperature is 100.2. The rest of his vitals are normal. He does have some epigastric tenderness. Um, his labs are notable for creatinine of 1.4, which is about his baseline. His LFTs are mildly elevated. His tacrolimus level is 7.7. His white count is 2.8. Uh, he's a bit anemic, and, but has normal platelets. So for an initial workup, he gets blood cultures, urine cultures, these are negative. He has an abdominal CT scan that doesn't really show anything of note. And then he has an EGD that shows esophagitis with um, multiple small shallow ulcers in the gastric antrum. The most likely diagnosis is A, EBV-associated PTLD, B, peptic ulcer disease, C, CMV gastritis, D, helicobacter pylori infection, or E, disseminated BK virus infection. And I will... Go ahead and ring in. Okay, I will stop there. Let's see how people voted. All right, everybody knows this question. Good, that's the way it should be. CMV, I think, is, is the most important infection um, after renal transplant or any solid organ transplant, to be honest. Um, and the rest of these answers, you know, peptic ulcer disease and helicobacter pylori often cause ulcers in the duodenum. Um, and the story just mostly fits with CMV. So let's talk about CMV. Um, CMV and renal transplant, post-transplant CMV reactivation is associated with both direct and indirect effects um, that lead to increased morbidity. So the direct effects, so the sort of the first step to having CMV reactivation is asymptomatic viremia. Why do we care? We care um, for direct effects because we worry that this is going, if you don't do something about it, it will lead to symptomatic disease. So symptomatic disease includes CMV syndrome, which is characterized by fevers, low white blood cell count, typically abnormal LFTs, and leukopenia. Usually that's how the person would show up. So if our patient that I just described didn't have gastric pain and ulcers, he would have CMV syndrome. Um, so then that's the most common. Next most common is gastrointestinal disease like our patient, and it can affect the GI tract anywhere from sort of mouth to rectum. Um, and then pneumonitis is really quite rare. I, I can't think of the last time I actually saw a case of CMV pneumonitis. Um, and that may have something to do with our prophylactic strategies these days. And then CMV retinitis is very, very rare. We do think about it in patients who show up with very high level viremia. We oftentimes will ask ophthalmology to look um, because it's important to know if it's there. So what are the indirect effects of CMV? Um, we, we already talked about how it can increase your vulnerability to other infections, which is important. Um, it's possible that, that stimulating the immune system with CMV is going to increase your risk for rejection, but I think people most recently have been caring a lot about this third one, which is this increased risk of death or cardiovascular death long term. So there have been a couple recent database studies that have showed an increased risk for death which is mostly related to cardiovascular death and graft failure in those patients who are at high risk for CMV who did not receive prophylaxis. So the implication is that having CMV reactivation at, at any level presumably sort of leads to an, an inflammatory sort of cascade that, that increases your cardiovascular risk. People are, are sort of thinking about this and researching this pretty actively at the moment. <clears throat> 
So how do you diagnose CMV? Um, CMV serologies are important to check in the recipient and the donor before you take them to transplant in order to stratify their risk for reactivation. They are not at all helpful in determining if somebody has CMV reactivation after transplant. So the way we mostly detect this is by um, virus load testing or quantitative nucleic acid testing, a PCR-based assay. It's going to detect CMV virus in blood or serum. Um, so I mentioned the PP65 antigenemia testing because some centers will still use this. It's, it's fairly antiquated, but basically it's a, you take whole blood and the technician will basically, you know, put the white blood cells on a smear. So sometimes they'll do it on a buffy coat so you get all the white cells. And you stain them for CMV antigens, and then the technician has to read the number of cells that stain positive. And 10 or more is typically considered positive. Um, that being said, it does depend on having a good technician and having a normal white blood cell count. So in neutropenic patients, this is not necessarily a very accurate measure, or I should say leukopenic patients, right? Because it's, it's usually lymphocytes that are infected. So we don't use it very much anymore. Um, tissue diagnosis, this is the, the main way you can diagnose tissue invasive disease, like our case patient. You need to visualize inclusion bodies, or you can detect it by antigens um, with the immuno, the immunohistochemical staining. Okay, so transplant recipients who are seropositive for CMV or who receive a transplant from a seropositive donor are gonna be at risk. Um, so the highest risk is going to be the donor positive, recipient negative, because basically you're taking somebody who has never had CMV in their life, you're giving them, a, you know, induction for their transplant, and then you're popping an organ in there that has an infection in it. And so they're most likely going to get it. Um, so 40 to 58% of D plus R minus renal transplant patients will develop reactivation in the absence of prophylaxis. Who, the people who have negligible risk are going to be the CMV, IgG negative donor and recipient combo. Um, those patients, you do have to remember, remain at risk for HSV and VZV. So while you might not need to prophylax them for CMV, you need to remember the other herpes viruses that can reactivate. So the, the timing of risk without prophylaxis, the highest risk is going to be three to six months after transplant. In patients who receive prophylaxis, the CMV risk is highest in the first three to six months after their prophylaxis ends. And this is referred to as delayed onset CMV infection. So you might argue, well, why bother prophylaxing if they're just gonna reactivate three to six months after you stop it? So it turns out when you give prophylaxis, you do reduce the overall rate of CMV reactivation because you're getting people further out from that induction immunosuppression. So um, you're, you're allowing them to sort of rebuild their immune system a little bit so that they can respond to the virus and, and manage it without having a full-blown reactivation. CMV risk is also high in the first few months after you treat rejection. So you need to think about reinstituting prophylaxis then. So how, how do we go about preventing CMV reactivation? Um, most centers in the U.S. will use universal prophylaxis. So that means you treat everybody who's at risk for CMV for three to six months. And, you know, most centers these days stratify by the risk. So D plus R minus will get longer than the D plus R plus or the D minus R plus. Um, so this is going to prevent early reactivation. And most importantly, we think it prevents the indirect effects of CMV. Um, it is associated with delayed onset CMV, and particularly among the high risk D plus R minus recipients, depending upon prophylaxis length. So there was an important study several years ago that looked at three versus six months for these patients um, with prophylaxis. And um, of the 51 patients, uh, excuse me, of the 176 patients who were D plus R minus, who got three months of prophylaxis, 51 of them, or 29%, developed CMV. Um, after the prophylaxis stopped. So this rate is quite high. It's not as high as if you gave no prophylaxis, but it was high enough that most centers use six months for these patients now. So what's the alternative? The alternative is preemptive therapy, which is routine monitoring of the CMV virus load or antigen weekly to biweekly for the first six months. You would treat CMV viremia, hopefully before they develop disease. This is associated with decreased antiviral toxicities and cost, but it may not prevent the indirect effects of CMV. Um, and that's what we are caring about more recently. Um, and I'll remind you, these recent studies showed increased mortality, and they actually had increased graft failure in D plus R minus recipients who did not receive prophylaxis.
So back to the case, the patient is treated with valgenciclovir and discharged home. He comes back to clinic two weeks later for routine follow-up, and he actually generally feels better. Um, his physical exam is unremarkable. His labs are notable for a white count of 1.2, hematocrit of 31, and platelets of 215. His creatinine is at baseline at 1.35, and his LFTs are normal. Uh, worsening leukopenia is likely due to A, delayed effect of ATG, B, valgenciclovir resistant CMV infection, C, lack of response to CMV therapy, D, synergistic effect of trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole and mycophenolate, or E, toxicity of valgenciclovir. So, whoops, geez, let me make it so you can ring in. Okay. I'm gonna cut you off, sorry. <laughs> Gotta keep moving. Okay, so most, most people thought it was E, the toxicities of valgenciclovir, which is correct. Um, so uh, we'll review sort of valgenciclovir toxicities in a minute. I will say ATG does not usually have such a delayed effect. It can make you leukopenic, but not that late. Um, and this patient is better, so that seems like B and C would just not be correct, because the patient actually feels a lot better. Um, and then we all know that Bactrim and mycophenolate can cause low white cell counts, but this is a new problem, and his doses of those haven't changed. So ganciclovir and valganciclovir remain the mainstay of treatment and prophylaxis for CMV. Ganciclovir is a guanosine analog that inhibits CMV replication. It's available as an intravenous formulation. Um, in the international setting, I think you can still get it orally, but in the US, you can't. It's very poorly absorbed orally. So the oral alternative is valganciclovir, which is the oral prodrug of ganciclovir, which has excellent oral bioavailability. It is also renally cleared, so you need to dose adjust um, if somebody has diminution in their creatinine clearance. Uh, both, both are FDA approved for, oh, wait, oh, there, sorry, my screen went dark for a sec. Um, both are FDA approved for CMV prophylaxis in transplant patients. It's actually off-label to treat CMV with these, but we do it all the time. Um, so ganciclovir and valganciclovir have side effects. This is their problem. It's predominantly dose-dependent leukopenia and neutropenia. So um, this is probably a wildly unpopular statement to make with a bunch of nephrologists in the room, but when leukopenia due to valganciclovir develops, treatment dose should not be reduced or stopped. That is the typical knee-jerk response. Oh, let's just reduce the valganciclovir dose. That's not the right answer. Um, you should only adjust it if their creatinine clearance diminishes um, because when you give them suboptimally dosed valganciclovir, Occasionally, a patient will develop resistant CMV, and when that happens, it's kind of a disaster because we don't have good treatment alternatives. So what we do have available now um, includes foscarnet and cytofovir, neither of which are particularly appealing for the renal transplant patient. Foscarnet can cause serious electrolyte abnormalities that are very difficult to manage, typically have to be managed in the inpatient setting. Cytofovir is quite nephrotoxic, even when you give it with hydration and probenicid. Um, so there are a lot of investigational agents out there for CMV right now, meribavir, brins cytofovir, which is also known as CMX001, and latermavir. I will tell you that meribavir and brins cytofovir have both been tried for prophylaxis compared to placebo and stem cell transplant patients, and neither of them worked. And um, brins cytofovir was a bit of a disaster. It led to increased mortality due to the side effect, the primary side effect, which is diarrhea. So in that patient population, it, it both didn't work and caused a lot of... Um, Trouble. So Brin cytofovir is, is not currently being investigated at all anymore for the treatment of uh, for the treatment, excuse me, of um, CMV. It's only available right now in study form for adenovirus therapy. Latermavir is still in clinical trials, so we'll see about that one. So let's move on and talk about BK virus. Um, in a patient with a history of BK virus nephropathy now considering retransplantation, A, the patient needs a transplant nephrectomy, B, there's no risk of recurrent BK infection after retransplant, C, obtain an emergency IND after retransplant to prophylactically treat with Brin cytofovir, D, the patient should have screening for BK viremia after retransplant, or E, prophylactically treat with leflunamide. So you can go ahead and ring in. This one's not as easy as the last one. <laughs> okay. And we'll stop. Okay. So, but most of you got it right. Um, D is correct. 
which we'll review over the next few slides. This patient should have screening um, after retransplant. And in my next few slides, we'll review why the other answers are not right. So BK virus is a polyoma virus. 60 to 80 percent of adults are seropositive worldwide. Primary infection probably occurs during childhood. JC virus is the other clinically important polyoma virus, although there are like eight or nine others, um, including WU and KI, that probably cause some sort of form of respiratory tract illness. Um, it causes the majority of polyoma virus-associated nephropathy in renal transplant patients. Occasionally, people postulate that, that JC virus does. Um, every now and again. It's also associated with hemorrhagic cystitis in stem cell transplant patients early after transplant. So, and, and there's sort of a growing evidence that some of those patients also get nephropathy from it. Um, the estimated prevalence of polyoma virus associated nephropathy after renal transplant is one to 10%. And it's usually in the first year after transplant. In the absence of intervention, you can have up to 50% graft loss. Some studies have focused on the risk with specific immunosuppressive agents, but really the risk is probably higher with increased immunosuppression regardless of which agent you're using. Um, it's di diagnosed histologically on renal biopsy with immunohistochemical stains. Um, early polyomavirus nephropathy is patchy, so you can miss it on the biopsy. Um, and the development of polyomavirus associated nephropathy is typically going to be preceded first by high grade BK viuria and then viremia, which is what's, um, oh, excuse me, and an estimated 10 to, uh, excuse me, 20 to 29 percent of renal transplant patients are going to develop viremia. Not all of those patients would go on to develop nephritis. That's what's hard about this particular virus. So, this is sort of a, a graphic illustration of how um, more people will get viuria. Um, and then progress to viremia, and then um, to nephropathy. So the best studied treatment for polyoma virus-associated nephropathy is reduction in immunosuppression. That is the key thing to remember here. There have been a lot of things that have been studied. Um, fluoroquinolones, there's been two different randomized placebo-controlled trials of levofloxacin, one for prevention and one for pr treatment of BK viremia. And there was no difference between levofloxacin and placebo in either study. So it just doesn't work, is the bottom line. Um, other potential treatments that people sort of chatter about include cytofavir, Brin cytofavir, leflunamide, IVIG, statins. Um, you know, most of these have just not consistently shown benefit. Um, and I will say as a side note, Brin cytofavir in the clinical trial that looked at it in stem cell transplant patients for CMV prophylaxis, they also tracked people's um, BK viuria in that study, and there was literally no difference between the placebo arm and the Brin cytofavir arm. So although there are case reports out there of Brin cytofavir treating, BK nephropathy. I, I, I find it hard to, believe, to put a lot of stock in the case reports when we have a randomized trial where it appeared that the drug had no effect on, on um, BK in the urine. Early recognition is thought to pretend better outcomes with this illness. So um, you want to prospectively monitor or screen. Um, most centers do that in the US. Typically, you want to do it monthly for the first three to six months, and then every three months until about two years. Those with significant BK viremia can be preemptively treated with immunosuppression reduction. So let's move on and talk about fungal infection. Um, and we'll do our last case. This is a 65-year-old man with fevers to 102, malaise, nausea, and mild abdominal pain. Uh, his medical history is notable for end-stage renal disease due to lithium toxicity, and he had a renal transplant four years ago. His bipolar affective disorder, anxiety, and atrial fibrillation. His meds include tacrolimus, mycophenolate, prednisone, olanzapine, lorazepam, verapamil, and warfarin. Um, his vital signs are essentially normal. When he comes in, he's overweight, uh, he's in no acute distress, his cardiac exam is irregularly irregular. His abdomen is actually not tender, um, and he has no rashes. His labs are notable for creatinine at baseline at 0 0.8. His LFTs are very mildly elevated, um, and the rest of his labs are normal, except for his INR, which is therapeutic at 2.1. Um, his, he has an abdominal CT scan that's unremarkable. He has blood cultures drawn, and after 24 hours, two out of four bottles grow yeast. The most likely pathogen is A, A, Aspergillus fumigatus, B, Rhizopus pusillus, C, Cryptococcus neoformans, D, Stenotrophomonas maltophilia, or E, Aspergillus niger. I'll let you ring in. <laughs> 
Okay. We'll stop there. Let's see what people thought. Whoops. Okay. Ah, see, this is a little more fun. People are guessing a little all over the map. I actually agree with the majority of you um, that C is the correct answer, and I will review why now. So um, it turns out that Cryptococcus is the only yeast on this list. All the rest are not yeasts. So Aspergillus, Rhizopus, and Asper uh, Aspergillus fumigatus, Aspergillus niger, and Rhizopus all grow as mold. Uh, blood culture, like they rarely grow in blood culture, but if they do, they grow as a mold. So the microbiology lab would call you and say, hey, there's a mold growing in this blood, not a yeast. So that's why those are wrong. And then Stenotrophomonas is actually bacteria. I just like the name. I thought it might trick you guys. So uh, we'll talk a little more about fungal infections now. So the Transnet survey tracks invasive fungal infections and transplant recipients at 15 U.S. centers. They collected data from 2001 to 2006. It's really a helpful study. So the cumulative incidence of fungal infection in renal transplant recipients in the first 12 months after transplant was 1.3%. That was actually the lowest stat for any transplant. So better than hearts, better than lungs, better than livers. So the bottom line is renal transplant patients don't get a lot of fungal infections, which is a good thing. The most common fungal infections in renal transplant recipients in this study was candida at about 50%, cryptococcus was the second most common at 15%, and aspergillus at 14%. And then endemic mycoses accounted for a decent amount, and that, that sort of lumps together um, coccidiomycosis and histoplasmosis. Candida um, is often an early post-transplant complication like we already talked about. So it's typically related to the procedure or the hospitalization. Um, and so we're not gonna talk much more about that. Um, so the other fungal infections, you really need to think about the epidemiology of the patient, and it does depend on geography. So coccidiomycosis is an important cause of fungal infection after renal transplant in Arizona. Its estimated incidence there is 3.8 to 6.9%. This is something that patients get prophylaxed for. If you're transplanted in Arizona, you get serologies checked before transplant, and you get prophylaxed if you've been exposed. And this is just a map showing you where, where um, coccidioides is endemic. So where you're located matters. Um, so back to our case, though, the yeast was identified as Cryptococcus neoformans. The patient was initially treated with liposomal amphotericin, and his fevers go away. He's a lumbar puncture because it was Cryptococcus, and that was normal. So it was just um, fungemia, not uh, meningitis. The patient has switched to fluconazole, 400 milligrams by mouth daily at discharge. So let's talk a little bit about Cryptococcus and transplant. Cryptococcus is often late after transplant. So the median time is 83 to 85 months after transplant. So again, these patients are running into the Cryptococcus probably sometime after their transplant when they're sort of living out in the world. Um, this picture up there is actually a, a very nice picture of uh, Cryptococcus in, in a lymph node. That's the purple dots with sort of the white halo around it, which is the capsule. The spectrum of cryptococcal disease can range. So you can see fungemia like our patient with or without um, a focus, so meningitis is sort of the second most common thing we see. Isolated pulmonary infection um, is a really important thing to remember, and then soft tissue and osteoarticular infection are quite uncommon. So in the last several years, pulmonary infection has become more common, um, and it's typically asymptomatic, and the, the story is typically it's like a renal transplant patient who gets a chest x-ray for some reason, and somebody notices a nodule, and then they get a chest CT, and somebody says, oh my gosh, you might have lung cancer, and then they go see the thoracic surgeon, and the thoracic surgeon whacks out this you know, one centimeter nodule, and then the path on it comes back showing yeast. And so uh, those patients uh, usually just get treated with a short course of something like fluconazole, um, but it, it comes up more and more these days. Um, so how do you treat cryptococcus? Lipid formulations of amphotericin or fluconazole are indicated depending upon the site of infection. So if you have meningitis or, or fungemia, you typically start with amphotericin-based formulations, and then um, depending upon how the person is doing, you can, you can go down to the azole um, if they had uh, fungemia. 5-flucytosine is used with the amphotericin if they have meningitis, typically. So back to uh, the, the case, the patient presents for follow-up one week later. He doesn't really have many complaints, except he has, he has a new tremor. Um, he has not had any fevers. Um, he, his labs are notable for a creatinine of 1.97 now, which is almost double his baseline. His LFTs are normal. His white count is normal. His INR is a bit up at 4.1. 
Which of the following is correct? The tremor and worsening renal function are probably due to undiagnosed cryptococcal meningitis. The worsening renal function is probably due to rejection stimulated by the recent infection. C, the worsening renal function and tremor are probably due to the addition of fluconazole to his regular medications. Or D, the worsening renal function is probably due to new BK nephropathy because one opportunistic infection leads to another. So I'll let you ring in. Okay, I will stop, and let's see. Whoop, let's see what people thought. Okay, everybody who rung in thought it was C. You guys don't need this lecture. Everybody knows the answers. Uh, the answer is C. <laughs> so, which we'll we'll review in a minute. Um, so, uh, the, a word about cryptococcal meningitis. If you've done the LP and it's negative, it's negative. You didn't miss it. So that's definitely not what's going on in this patient. And then I think rejection or BK nephropathy would be too sudden onset, you know, a week after you had cryptococcus. That, that seems a little dramatic. So um, azoles interact with a lot of drugs um, because they inhibit hepatic enzymes CYP3A4, 2C9, et cetera. Voriconazole is going to be the, the most uh, interactive. Posiconazole and itraconazole are similar. Um, and then fluconazole and isobuconazole, um, which is a new agent, are, are sort of the weakest of the um, inhibitors. This leads to increased concentrations of a lot of different medicines, not just the transplant meds. Um, obviously, in the renal transplant patient, you're going to worry the most about their immunosuppression, so the tacrolimus, the serolimus, et cetera. It can also interact, though, with their statins, some calcium channel blockers, some benzos, some opiates, warfarin. Um, obviously, if the person has concurrent HIV, you can also create some havoc with some of their HIV meds. Um, so it's really important to think through all these things with azoles. So initiation or cessation of any azole in a patient on immunosuppressants requires dose adjustment and close therapeutic drug monitoring. It is not a good idea to put someone on fluconazole and send them out the door if they're inpatients. You want to do make that change before they leave so you can sort of monitor their drug levels. Okay, so in summary, um, when you're evaluating a renal transplant patient with infection, timing is key. Um, if the infection happens in the first month, um, it's typically related to the surgery or nosocomial pathogen. If it's in the first, if it's one to six months after transplant or after a recent episode of rejection, it's typically opportunistic. And then if it's more than six months after transplant and no rejection, it's often community acquired. Important pathogens we talked about include CMV, which is probably the most important infection after renal transplant, um, and when you use prophylaxis, reactivation is late, and the current uh, treatments leave much to be desired in terms of side effects, but that's all we've got right now, so you have to do your best to manage with it. Um, BK virus is a significant cause of graft failure, and you have to remember that you want to monitor patients, and immunosuppression reduction is really the key to managing this infection. Fungal infection is relatively uncommon after renal transplant. Candida and cryptococcus are the most common infections, and azoles and immunosuppressants have a lot of drug-drug interactions, so you have to remember that. All right. Um, and I can take questions now. I also have a little extra material. Do you, time-wise, how are we? Okay, do you want me to do, okay. How about, I'll, I'll um, I have a few extra slides. We might as well go through. Okay. Extra bonus question here with a common problem after renal transplant. So this is a 63-year-old woman with a history of HIV-associated nephropathy who presents for routine follow-up. Her renal transplant was 10 months ago. She has CMV D plus R minus, and she finished valgan ciclovir and trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole prophylaxis about four months ago. Um, she has no health complaints. Um, and her medications include abacavir, lamivudine, dolutegravir, tacrolimus, mycophenolate, and prednisone. Um, her routine labs are uh, normal. Urine culture is collected at this visit for sort of surveillance purposes, and it grows greater than 100,000 colonies of Klebsiella pneumoniae. It's ampicillin, cefazolin, uh, nitrofurantoin, levofloxacin resistant, susceptible to tetracycline, amoxicillin clavulinate, ceftriaxone, and then it's intermediate to ciprofloxacin. All right. The patient has no medication allergies. The best management is A, treat with ciprofloxacin, B, treat with nitrofurantoin, C, observe, D, admit for IV ceftriaxone, or E, resume trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole prophylaxis.
Oops, let me, okay, you can ring in. Okay, I'm gonna cut you off now. Okay, well, let's see what people said. Oops. Aha, I knew this question would get a lot of different answers. It was actually based on a real case that I saw. Um, and I will say that bug grew in the urine like many times. Um, so I, I think that um, one could make an argument for a lot of different things. I kind of set you up because I gave you a lot of susceptibilities, but it turns out that the antibiotic choices I gave you, none of them would actually work. Um, ceftriaxone, like it wouldn't be susceptible to ceftriaxone. It's intermediate to ciprofloxacin. It's not, it's uh, resistant to nitrofurantoin. So like A, B, and D wouldn't work. Trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, prophylaxis, I guess you could argue that because you'd say, well, she's getting UTIs. It's these cases are really hard because this is a postmenopausal woman who, um, you know, it's not a great idea to check urine cultures in them without cause because we know that postmenopausal women just have bacteria. So there are some increasing data now that show that you, it might be okay to just observe these patients, and I'll review those data because this is a, I think this is a common thing that comes up in renal transplant patients. So UTI is really common. Um, estimated 23 to 75% of transplant patients will develop a UTI after transplant. Um, how do you prevent it? So we know that trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole prophylaxis can reduce the frequency of UTIs and other bacterial infections. So it's great for the first six months after transplant. It does keep a lot of people out of trouble. So the current um, guidelines suggest six to 12 months of trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole after transplant. The alternative agent for somebody who is sulfa allergic is nitrofurantoin. So many centers routinely check urine cultures at follow-up, and this, you're gonna detect asymptomatic bacteria like this patient. So should you treat or not? Or should you even have checked? That's a bigger question. So the pros of treating are that you're gonna prevent the development of symptomatic UTI, pyelonephritis, or even a subsequent sepsis or bacteremia, right? The cons are that antibiotic exposure leads to what's called collateral damage, meaning risk for things like C. diff or dysbiosis. Um, you know, people can, these patients are at increased risk for tendinopathy from quinolones. So if you give them a quinolone, you might end up with like a, a um, tendon problem. Um, I have seen tendon rupture in a renal transplant patient. So two recent studies have looked at asymptomatic bacteria, and I think they're helpful. So one was a retrospective study of 112 patients with asymptomatic bacteria. 22 were treated and 90 were not treated. And there was no difference in symptomatic UTI um, or more than 25% reduction in GFR or any other endpoint. So it did not appear to matter. Um, this was retrospective, though, so it's not random who got treated and who didn't. So then this other really interesting trial looked at um, a little over 100 patients with asymptomatic bacteria, and they were randomized to treatment versus observation, and there was no difference in pyelonephritis, rejection, lower urinary tract infection symptoms, C. diff, resistant bacteria, or graft function. So it didn't appear to matter for either, you know, development of these bad infectious complications or development of collateral damage. It didn't matter if you were treated or not. The one thing I will say about this second study is a lot of the people that were randomized to the treatment arm, the treatment got really aggressive. If you were detected to have a third episode of bacteria and you had a resistant bug, they would like admit you to the hospital and you would get like four weeks or six weeks of IV antibiotics. So a lot of patients were not compliant in the treatment arm. So more patients in this study were not getting, getting treated than, than they had planned out. But I think these are provocative studies and I think we're, you know, over time, hopefully guidelines will speak a little bit more to this. Um, because right now they're silent, but, but I think that it would be nice if we could save some people some antibiotics or save some urine cultures that we don't really need to check. Um, and that was it for my slides. I can take questions if we have time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so that is what my patient that I just presented had. It made us feel really uncomfortable. We evolved it that way. We treated a couple times and it kept being there. 
And at some point, if the patient's completely well, you have to man up and decide whether you're going to admit them to treat it or whether you're just going to say, you know what, let's just monitor how you're doing really closely and you know, you call right away for any fever. And I think a lot of that depends upon the patient and how reliable they are and, and this sort of thing. But this is why I hope guidelines will address this in the future because it's, it's a little scary to ignore an ESBL and a renal transplant patient's um, urine. And I will say these two studies were looking at patients that were more than six months out from transplant. I don't think anyone would ignore a positive urine culture in the first six months after transplant. Like I, I think everyone would, would treat that. Any other questions? Sorry, say again? Ah, if she had AKI, would we treat it? Potentially, you might, you might think that if the patient had AKI that the, the bacteria was contributing. So you would say that that's not, I mean, it's asymptomatic, I guess, but, but you think that it's causing end organ damage and you'd be more worried that it's pylo. So yeah, I, I think these, all these things need to be um, further studied. And th these, this last case was more provocative than it was guiding you on your, your boards. Because I think, you know, when they ask you on the boards if somebody has bacteria at six months after transplant, the answer is probably going to be treat it. <laughs> but um, over time, we might evolve into l treating less aggressively. Yeah. Yeah, hep C, the hep C and transplantation is really um, evolving, and, and I do know that that um, you know I think that we will rest on sort of a more uniform policy, but I do know some centers will sort of hold off on treating patients who are waiting to get a transplant so that they're eligible to get a hepatitis C positive donor, and then you can treat both you know, after, after the transplant. I mean, it is a little more complicated treating hepatitis C in a patient who um, has end-stage renal disease anyway. You know, as you know, those drugs are not nearly as well studied in somebody with um, reduced GFR. And so um, in, in some ways, it's easier to treat them, envision treating them after they have a more normal creatinine clearance anyway. But yeah, some, some centers are doing that, yeah. Mm-hmm. At what level of viuria would you get concerned? Without viremia. Without viremia. Huh. That's a good question. You know, funny thing, I talk about BK, but it's my colleagues who really manage it because I don't reduce people's immunosuppression, right? I don't touch the immunosuppression or else I'll get in trouble. Yeah, so um, our, pra our practice at my center is that typically if somebody's admitted for tissue invasive disease, we do often give them gancyclovir until we feel like they are starting to show evidence that they're better. What's challenging is um, sometimes if somebody has CMV viremia along with their end organ disease, which isn't always the case, right? Sometimes you can show up with just colitis and it's not detectable in your blood. But if it is detectable in your blood, sometimes what happens is you start treating and somebody will send a virus load off on like day five of treatment and it is way higher than it was before. So you, you can't reliably 
follow the viremia to sort of make you feel like somebody's on their way to getting better. So I usually go symptomatically, and you want to make sure that somebody is a, like definitely not nauseous or vomiting or having any issues with absorption. And you know, th this comes up a lot actually in the stem cell transplant patients I see. And we always use tacrolimus in those patients or serolimus as our surrogate marker of how well they're absorbing, like based on what dose they're getting and, and whether they have good, good levels before we'll say, okay, you know what, let's just go to Valgan Ciclovir.